Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our second speaker. I'm very glad to have him here. Uh, it took us a little while, uh, especially because his two new books, uh, which he's actually selling by the kilo this time, <laughs> uh, we're finally ready, so it was a little late, so I had to switch lectures, so sorry about that. But here he is, actually, and I'm very glad to have him here to talk about the dependence of the Philippines. Please welcome my good friend Stuart. Well, hello. It's absolutely lovely to be here. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about the Nepenthes of the Philippines. Um, obviously, out of the, the, the Nepenthes of the world, the Philippines really has re remained one of the, um, the least studied of all the groups. Um, and they really include some inc incredible species. And so the point of this presentation is, uh, is really to, to give you a, a general overview of these, these amazing Nepenthes of, of these Philippine islands. Um, obviously, the Philippines is an incredibly diverse country, consisting of approximately 7,000 islands spread across, well, yeah, a large swathe of, of, um, of the Eastern Hemisphere, north of Borneo. Um, we have two major islands which are mainly significant with Nepenthes. That is um, Mindanao down here and Palawan up here, with different species scattered across, as, as we're going to see shortly. Um, I just want to give you a quick introduction, because the Philippines is a wonderful country. Um, it's, this is the, the characteristic jeepney, which is uh, what everyone gets to, to, to use and, and ride around. And for Nepenthes, well, this is my friend Alistair. Um, we spent about 10, about 12 weeks actually going across the archipelago, um, trying to study and, and photograph and document all of the species that you're going to see shortly. Um, as I say, it's a wonderful country. Um, they're the friendliest people that I've met, I think, ever. Um, but it's the most random place I have ever been. For example, where else could you, um, could you for example, take a ride full of, uh, on a bus full of goats? <laughs> or, um, or, for example, take your chicken for a, for a walk in a bag. Um, these are the little feathers sticking out the, the top. Or, uh, or lastly, it's a, it's a country of flexible rules. Um, no passengers are allowed past this barrier, apparently, but nevertheless, this chicken is happily wandering around on a ferry. <laughs> And wonderful food as well. Um, enough said. Anyway, <laughs> um, on to the, the, uh, the Nepenthes. Um, it's very interesting because it actually has the highest rates of endemism of all of the regions where Nepenthes occur. Um, fully uh, 23 species out of the 24 that occur across the Philippine Islands are actually endemic to those areas. And if you look at the breakdown of the other major regions where Nepenthes occurs, it's significantly higher proportionally than, than all of them. Um, Basically, for, for Nepenthes, as I mentioned earlier, there's two very significant islands where, where the diversity is concentrated. And that is Mindanao down in the south and Palawan, well, just over there. It's very interesting because obviously um, it's extremely close to Borneo. And during, during different periods in, in the recent past, there's actually been various land bridges uh, collect, connecting the islands. Basically, when sea level reduces during um, glacial times, the, the various islands have been connected, allowing migration of plants and animals. So a lot of the plants that you'll see in this talk are actually, some of them have affinities to ones in, Borneos, in Borneo. And it's generally taken that, that those land bridge connections are a, are a direct reason for that. Um, so across the, the Philippine archipelago, this species is, is very widespread. It occurs on, on all of the major islands except Palawan. Um, it's Nepenthes alata, and um, it, it can truly be said to be one of the most variable of all the Nepenthes of the world. It has a, a, a spectrum of color forms, a spectrum of picture shapes, sizes. Um, the leaf morphology is very, very variable indeed. Um, it, as you can see, it, it ranges from pretty much pure green to some spectacular variants with a blood red peristome and a, and a red underside of the lid, all the way to pure red, uh, red coloration pictures. Um, they grow in a huge range of habitats as well, and this, this particular species is interesting because it's often very common in, uh, in recently de um, degrade, degraded or, uh, or, or disturbed habitats. And as you can see here, it's actually growing in a, in a pasture where, um, where these cows are grazing. Um, the next species, we're just looking at them in alphabetical order here, is um, the diminutive um, Nepenthes argentii, which is known only from the very upper slopes of this mountain, Mount Gitong Gitong, um, on Sibuyan Island. Um, it's a spectacular species, but it's one of the smallest of all the Nepenthes, producing pictures in the wild generally up to two, maybe three centimeters or so in size. And it's very interesting because it actually has, um, the peristome actually continues onto the lower surface of the lid. So it has sort of almost like little teeth on the, on the, on the lower surface of the lid, a bit, bit similar to um, Bicalcarata in a slightly different way. 
Um, this, this is um, a, a species from Palawan, Nepenthes attenborii, which I was very lucky to find a few years ago. Um, I'm going to be talking quite a bit about Palawan in a few slides' time. Um, it grows on the summit of one mountain called Mount Victoria, and the entire population occurs in an area maybe about 10 times the area of this room. It's a very localised species. And it's, uh, it's very notable because it produces magnificent um, infundibular traps up to about 30, 35 or so centimetres tall. And um, we decided to name it after, after David Attenborough, the, the noted um, naturalist, after his, his, he's done a lot of conservation work in the Eastern Hemisphere. It's really interesting because it obviously shows a lot of similarity to Nepenthes raja and a number of other closely related species, but yet it's, it's morphly, morphologically distinct in, in a whole plethora of, of, of ways. Um, in, in, I guess in contrast, this tiny little species, um, which is, occurs across from Mindanao up to Dinagat Island, I guess is, is a bit of a contrast. It produces very small traps, um, generally about, um, about two to three to four centimetres or so in size. Again, like many of the Philippine sp species, we actually see a huge diversity of colour forms occurring in the wild. And as you can see here, the picture coloration can, can again range from, from pure blood red all the way to pure, pure um, yellowish green. And uh, in the wild, yeah, you get pretty much every spectrum of, of variation in between those, those colours. This is a very interesting plant, Nepenthes burkei. It actually um, was discovered in the 19th century, but for a long time was considered um, synonymous with Nepenthes ventricosa. Um, the recent work of Chen Li actually, um, actually found that not to be the case. And I basically retraced um, Chen's footsteps and um, found it on Mount Halcon, where it, it, it's exclusively known to occur. What's really interesting with a lot of these Nepenthes from the Philippines is that the overwhelming majority of the highland species, in fact, pretty much, most, pretty much all of them, are known really from only just one or two mountains and, and nowhere else. Um, the only exception I can think of at hand is, is Nepenthes coplandii, which, which is, is, occurs on two or three mountains, and Nepenthes ventricosa. But the overwhelming majority of the others are extremely localised, and in some cases the populations can be, can be very small indeed. Um, this is Nepenthes coplandii, again another species that was confused for a very long time with a, a close relative, um, Nepenthes alata that is. Um, it, it basically differs in that it has a, oops, a very distinctive upper picture morphology. The pictures are structurally um, infundibular and also there are subtle differences in the flower and the leaf structure as well. And the lower pictures as well um, are, are quite variable. This plant is very interesting because it grows very frequently, perhaps even mainly as, uh, as an epiphyte particularly on the mossy branches of pandanus trees. And um, I was very lucky to climb Mount Halcon a few years ago and cl basically climbing up the slopes of that mountain, you can find huge um, stands of this plant actually rooted directly to the, the trees themselves. And it's particularly interesting because the whole area is geothermal, so you're basically walking up rivers that are hot with these, these incredible nepenthes growing just above you um, in a really misty, spectacular, uh, spectacular habitat. One of the reasons why these Nepenthes of the Philippines have, have really remained quite obscure is that unfortunately the Philippines is, is a wonderful, beautiful country, but it's been plagued with, with a number of internal problems. Um, a couple of those being, unfortunately, uh, Islamic insurgency in the south and various other rebel groups and fractions, including communist, uh, communist forces as well down in, in some of the southern islands. So this species is, is one of the ones that has remained very little known for a, for a very long time. And um, actually, mainly through the, the, the work of, of Rob Cantley, who's here today, um, do we really know what we know about it today? Um, another case is, is this one. Um, this is Nepenthes diniana that was collected in, in 1899 by um, John McFarlane on Thumb Peak in Palawan. And this plant has a bit of an interesting story behind it. Um, I say it was collected in 1899, but unfortunately the herbarium specimens that were collected were actually destroyed in World War II. The, the entire herbarium in, in Manila was completely burnt down and, and bombed, unfortunately. So no one really knew anything about this plant um, for most of the 20th century. It was very, very obscure, and um, several ex expeditions had been launched to go and, go and try and find it. But unfortunately all of them had failed. Um, McFarlane's description is really quite distinctive, and it's, it's very, uh, very interesting and clear that it, it represented something, something of, of, of note, noteworthy. Um, so um, I was very lucky to go back with Alistair and, and Falker, and we, we tried to really, really put some time to finding it. We actually climbed three mountains. Um, two of them came up with absolutely nothing. The, the second one we actually climbed up, we reached a military outpost, and they actually escorted us off with M16s, which wasn't the best. <laughs> um, the third mountain we climbed, we, but after we'd, we'd failed those, those first two times, we went back to the maps, and, and I think Alistair suggested that, that Thumb Peak, um, sorry, in the, the, the type description, it, it was named Mount Polga, 
and we noticed on the map a, a mountain called Thumb Peak. And basically, Alistair put, put the two together that Thumb is, is Polgar in Spanish. And so we tried that mountain. And it was very interesting because it was located inside a gigantic prison ground. It was called the Iwahig Prison, which is like a, like a, a penal farm. So the prison, prisoners are actually allowed to, to be in that farm. They're allowed to cultivate crops, have animals in there. Um, but if they actually leave the compound, they get shot. Um, so, so we actually went to this, this prison warden and, and basically were begging for permission to, to climb this mountain that was slap bang right in the middle of this, this prison ground. And very graciously he actually allowed us to climb the mountain, but insisted that we had to be escorted by three murderers. So, um, so, so after a long, a long period of, of negotiation, we actually were lucky to climb that mountain and growing on the top, again, literally in an area maybe twice the size of this room, a tiny localized little area, um, we found this wonderful plant, um, which apparently hadn't been seen since 1899. And um, it's a very interesting and spectacular species because it's very similar to many of the other Palawan plants, but um, it produces these glorious, um, almost rugby ball kind of shaped um, bright red lower pitches, um, these really large, robust leaves, often amongst quite dense vegetation, um, and, and upper pitches that are green and in, in fundibular. These are the sort of intermediate ones here. Um, so it's a very distinctive plant, but yeah, there, there's, there's very few other high mountains near this, this part of Palawan. So it, it really could be localised completely to an area, just, just the size of this, a couple of sizes of this room. So that really emphasises the conservation value and the, and the importance of, um, of well, protecting this habitat because it would be so easy. I mean, one, one basically one poacher could pretty much go up there and, and wipe out the entire population. So it really is a priority that, that these plants are, um, are protected in that way. Um, this is another recent discovery. Um, it was named by um, my good friends Andreas Wisterbert and Joachim Nertz, and it grows on the tallest mountain on the island of Palawan, Mantelingahan. And uh, it's a spectacular plant. Um, it, it's really adapted to very highland environments, and it's much more smaller than, than the other Palawan species, but very, very beautiful and produces these, um, these pictures. They actually have a, a quite a distinctive, well, they often have a very distinctive like forked peristome with large um, spikes, inward protruding, protruding spikes, uh, just beneath the lid. And well, in my opinion, it, it has similarity to, um, to uh, Nepenthes villosa on Mount Kinabali, but other characteristics you know, suggest other, other relationships, but at least on a few superficial characteristics, it seems to be quite, quite similar to villosa. Um, this is a, a, a long-known species. Um, it's quite famed for producing some of the largest pictures in the genus. What you'll see through this talk is that many of the Philippine Nepenthes and many of the ones in the south really do produce gigantic traps and uh, this, is, this is one of the ones that really can produce immense pitches. Um, the pitches can easily be up to two litres or so in volume in the wild. Um, and it's quite interesting, they seem to be produced cyclically. Um, I went there um, basically at the end of the wet season and the onset of the dry season. And you can really see like a difference. This was in 2007. And obviously this pitch had presumably been produced a few months earlier and just since died. And it was significantly bigger than the ones that I was seeing. Um, but just so you can get a perspective, you can, I could easily put my hand pretty much inside both of those traps. Um, it's a very variable species, again, like many of these Philippine, Philippine ones. Um, and what's really interesting is that I actually found this plant growing in mangrove swamps. Um, it's actually rooted in, in, in saltwater brackish soil. Um, so it seems to be ecologically very variable as well. And um, yeah, it can range again all the way from yellow and green to blood red to even bright pink. I saw some wonderful bright pink ones. Um, I guess this is the other opposite, opposite end of the spectrum. Um, this is a very small species, a tiny little plant from Mount Hamigitan in Mindanao. It's, um, it was named by um, uh, Volker Heinrich, uh, Thomas Gronemeyer and, and myself a few years ago, and, or last year in fact. And uh, it's really interesting because it produces tiny pitches just two centimetres tall, and, but produces lots of them. So it's a very attractive plant. Um, I don't think it's actually in cultivation yet, but it would be a very attractive plant in cultivation because basically each little plant can have up to sort of 18, 19, 20 pitches. So it can be a very compact size, but just absolutely bristling with, with traps. Um, it can actually produce then a vine up to about four meters or so tall. And again, can range in color from bright, bright yellow to, um, to bright red. Um, this is another um, very interesting plant. It's, it's superficially very similar to Nepenthes alata, but the leaf structure sets it completely apart. It has petiolate leaves, and uh, as its name suggests, it's from Mindanao, but also is found on the island of Dinaga, north of, of Mindanao. Um, it, it has spectacular coloration, and pretty much it's a rainbow of color 
oh, <laughs> it's a rainbow of colour out in the world. <laughs> I'm not sure whether that was me or not. I don't know. Um, anyway, um, it, it can be a rainbow of coloration uh, ranging from, yeah, again, black um, speckles on the exterior to blood red ones. And often the peristome is quite elongated, which sets it apart superficially a little bit from a lata. But um, really, it's the, the, the leaf structure that does. Um, as you can see, like it has this very distinctive heart-shaped sort of leaf with, uh, with a very clear PTO um, at the base. And um, it, that is very, very, very distinctive. If you look at populations, because often it grows directly with alata, and they are very distinct. There, there seems to be um, a very clear line between these two plants. So I, I for one, think it's a, it's a very good species to recognize. Um, this is a, a, a beautiful plant, from again, from Palawan, um, Nepenthes mira. It produces large, robust lower pitches that are quite similar to um, Nepenthes diniana, and upper pitches that are virtually identical. But the, the flower structure, again, separates it apart from that, that species. This is, a, again, another large Nepenthes. Um, it produces spectacular blood red, often, pitches. It's Nepenthes peltata. And what's really interesting about this one is that the undersurface of the leaves, it's quite difficult to see here, but it, it, the undersurface is generally blood red. You can sometimes find a very small percentage that are pure green, but 99% of the plants in the world have a, a blood red undersurface of, of the leaf um, shape, of the leaf of, of the lamina. Um, and as you can see, again, a massive variation in color. But very interestingly with this one, there's never been upper pictures seen. Um, in every other species um, of, of Nepenthes in the Philippines, that you can see upper pictures in the wild. Despite extensive expeditions looking for them, this one has, has never been known to produce upper pictures. Um, it perhaps may do in stress circumstances, but at least in the wild under normal conditions, it, it doesn't really seem to do so. Um, um, this, this is a, a, another one from Mindanao. Um, this is part of a hybrid origin. Um, different theories have been informally suggested that it's a hybrid between, between a red form of Nepenthes alata and Nepenthes truncata. And um, as you'll see with Truncata in a few slides' time, you can see very clear resemblance in many characteristics and also the leaf shape. But typically, um, it, it, I mean, it's a very widespread species across central Mindanao, very, very uniform, very stable. It's very clearly reproducing on its own. So it, it's, I think it's generally regarded that it's a good, valid species. But um, yeah, just simply derived of, of hybrid, hybridogenic origin, as many other Nepenthes are often seen to be, to be so. Um, this is a much less well-known Nepenthes. Um, it comes from, it's only known from Palawan. Um, basically, it's the equivalent of Nepenthes alata on the island of Palawan. Um, it, to be honest, I, I, I have a very hard time um, identifying or, or distinguishing between these two plants. And it really, if you put them side by side in cultivation, I think it would be very, very difficult. Um, perhaps there are differences. Um, I know Jeb and Cheek have, have identified gland structural differences and, and very small microscopic ones, but at least in the wild, it's, it's very difficult to, um, to fully establish whether it's the same as the Penthes alata or not. And reports have, have indicated that in the north of Palawan, there are actually Nepenthes alata plants. So it, it, it may or may not be the same as Nepenthes alata, but, but definitely needs to be studied in, in more detail. Um, this is another case of a very closely related species, Nepenthes alata, Nepenthes saranganiensis. And it, it basically differs, sorry, it de basically differs by um, the fact that the, the leaf is decurrent very much down the stem. So if you were to cut the stem in cross section, you'd have basically four or five ribbons of tissue that continue from basically the, the leaf blade all the way down the stem. So it basically has a stem lined in ribbons. But pretty much in, in, most, other, in most other characteristics, it, it's pretty much identical to alata. So that's, that's really the only characteristic that separates it. To be fair, it, it exclusively go, grows as an epiphyte. Um, it, it's only ever up on these huge branches of the mossy trees um, over in, in Mindanao. And that seems to be very much its, its distinctive habitat. Um, this is a, a widely known, widely grown species, um, the Penthes sibuyanensis from Sibuyan Island. Um, a beautiful plant um, that grows, again, on that ridge, that knife-head ridge where Nepenthes argentii grows that I showed you a few slides ago. Um, if you remember that zigzag ridge that goes right up into the clouds, Nepenthes argentii grows right at the top, and this one grows sort of along that ridge. Um, it's really interesting because its habitat is, uh, is surrounded on all sides by gigantic drops going off hundreds and hundreds of meters. So um, very fortunately, Argentia and this species seem to have a very secure future in the wild. In the wild. 
not only is the whole mountain actually a protected area, but uh, actually also it, it's just so inaccessible and dangerous to get to. Hopefully it'll never actually be, be fully threatened in the world. Um, this is a, a plant that, again, has been confused for a long time. As you'll notice, has been the case with many of the Philippine um, Nepenthes, just simply because so little work has, has really been done for, for much of the 21st century on them, um, which is a great shame, because as I hope as you're seeing, that they can be spectacular and beautiful and, and colourful and often very large species, but um, they've really kind of been neglected in favour of, of, of species from Borneo that are much more um, widely known and more famous and, I guess, in some cases, more accessible. Um, anyway, this, this is Nepenthes syrogoensis, and it occurs in the north of Mindanao, and basically it's very closely related to Nepenthes meruliana, but the recent studies of Thomas Gronemeyer and Volker Heinrich have actually identified a number of differences. Um, basically, um, this is very decurrent, it's covered with hairs, um, it actually does have a slightly different picture shape, and it grows in a completely different habitat that's completely separate from Nepenthes meruliana. Um, so, yeah, it, it's minor differences if you take them individually, but if you put them all together, the plant really is quite, quite distinct from the Penthes and I, I, I think I think they're absolutely right in, in regarding it as a, a distinct species because it really is quite, quite separate. Um, this spectacular plant is Nepenthes truncata, and it, it's very interesting because it does grow on the ground, but often also grows as epiphytes on the branches of gigantic lowland trees, again, in, in Mindanao. Um, and it's often very widespread in cultivation because it produces huge traps and truncated leaves from which it gets its name. And um, I think the last species of the Philippine ones is Nepenthes ventricosa. Um, the, this little species, again, occurs in a plethora of islands across the archipelago, or in the north of the archipelago, and, uh, and is very variable on each, on each island. Um, the pictures can range from pure white to almost, almost black peristome and red exterior. Now, I've shown you... Um, I've shown you the ones that have been known. Um, in the last year, we've, um, there's, there's three new species that have come to light, and I want to introduce them to you now in the second half of the, of the talk. All three of them are really interesting in many different ways, so I, I wanted to sort of separate them a little bit and, and tell you a bit about them in particular, because this is the first time that um, we've really been talking about them in, in public. Um, the first one is, is Nepenthes hamagitanensis, which Thomas Gronemeyer, Volker Heinrich, and, and I were, were fortunate to encounter two years ago. And um, basically, yeah, we went up in, in 2008 to Mount Hamigitan in the south of Mindanao. Um, we were, during that trip, we actually found this, this new plant, Micramphora, which I showed you a few seconds ago, and the recently named Nepenthes peltata. And it was very clear, obviously, Nepenthes micramphora was a separate and new species because it was completely different from Nepenthes peltata. Well, in addition to those two, we also found very large and very widespread populations of a different plant, which, to be honest, we, we kind of assumed at the time, or at least I assumed at the time, to be a hybrid. Um, Thomas and Volker Heinrich and, and Andreas Wisterber very um, diligently went back and, and studied it again in much more detail and actually identified that it really does have very distinct eco ecology, morphology and habitats. And um, we all decided to actually name it Nepenthes hamigitanensis in honour of the mountain where it occurs. Um, it, it's very probable that it also has a hybridogenic origin originating from a cross between Nepenthes peltata and Micramphora a long time ago, but, but it, it, it really has stabilised and it seems to be reproducing um, independently of those two plants and very large, relatively uniform populations, at least morphologically uniform populations, can be found in the wild. Anyway, this is what the pictures, the upper pictures look like. Um, it's really interesting because it grows mainly in a forested habitat, whereas the other two the two um, Micramphora and Peltata really don't. And um, it grows often as huge vines up in montane cloud forest, often in really mossy habitats. And um, the pictures have a very distinctive sort of bulge down in the lower, lower parts, um, which can, can, can be identified pretty much in all, all of the plants. Um, and yeah, basically it grows much higher up as well as both of the parents. Um, and yeah, as you can see clearly, um, just in size, it's sort of 10 times the size of Nepenthes micramphora. Um, and in terms of Nepenthes, although it has similarity to Nepenthes peltata in coloration, and, and very most likely got its coloration from, from that parent, um, it, it's distinct, it's very, very um, variable coloration, it's very distinct morphologically. Um, very interestingly, whereas Nepenthes peltata produces absolutely no upper pitches as far as ever been recorded in the world, this plant produces upper pitches very, very, very um, frequently, um, and the lower pitches are, are clearly different as well. 
Um, so this plant is interesting because it represents new species, but hopefully this is actually going to help Nepenthes uh, Mount Hamigitan actually maintain its status. It re was recently awarded a World Heritage Site status, and so um, the fact that there's now three endemic Nepenthes of this very ecologically uh, diverse and important mountain will hopefully help, um, help, help bring that, that, that um, status to the forefront. Um, I'm now, now going to show you Nepenthes palawanensis, which is um, a really interesting new plant. Basically, in, in February, I was fortunate to go back to um, Palawan um, with a friend from, from Palawan itself, Jason, and um, we actually went back to Mount Victoria, where Nepenthes atemburii grows. And basically, Nepenthes atemburii is on Mount Victoria, which is basically one side of a big horseshoe. And at the time when we climbed Mount Victoria, we noticed on the other side of the horseshoe, there was one really interesting mountain, which the locals called Sultan Peak. Um, it's very interesting because no one, as far as anyone in the, in the area knew, of, had, had ever really been up there. Um, this is actually Mount Victoria here, so Sultan Peak is on, on the other side, so somewhere over here. And as I say, Atemburai grows up here, but there's a very clear valley in between. So our logic in going back is that if Atemburai is on here, there might be a relative on the other mountain over here that's, that's similar, but, but slightly different, and because it's been isolated and, and clearly for a long time by, by a significant valley separating it. Um, so this is Sultan Peak in the background, and in, in February, I was very fortunate to join, join these friends and set off basically um, trailblazing um, to try and reach this mountain at the back. It was a very interesting um, climb. Um, we passed loads of hunters that had big spears with blades on the end that were, that were hunting pigs in the air, and um, I guess these are just some, some village dogs that were following us for a little bit. And, um, yeah, basically trekking. The only way we could get up here, there was absolutely no trails whatsoever. We, the only way we could really go was, was, was through the rivers. So we spent about two days basically following the rivers as high up as we could possibly get. And along the way, we saw hundreds and hundreds of Nepenthes philippinensis um, growing amongst the rocks and, and along the courses of the rivers, which is very typical habitat for it. Um, again, very variable, as I mentioned earlier, in shape and color. And in some plants, they look almost identical to an Nepenthes alata. Some others look quite different. Um, it's really interesting because um, there are occasionally visitors to this area, and, and they often collect Almasigo resin. And every now and then, would find a small camp or so of some um, hunters or, or Almasigo resin collectors on the lower slope. Um, so this is my this is my friend Jason and, and our fr three um, hunter guides that, that were taking us on on this trek. Um, and this was pretty much the, the train that we were dealing with. You just had to scramble up these rocks and, and, and boulders and passing some really amazing other plant life. Um, this is, I think, on the third day we actually reached a, a beautiful waterfall, which again, as far as anyone knew, that no one had really ever been up to. Um, it just literally flew off the, the side, falling hundreds of meters down. And, and so uh, we had to stay a bit clear of the edge. <laughs> and actually around that area, we found this interesting plant. It's very similar to Nepenthes um, philippinensis, but it's much, much bigger, very, very hairy on the outside, and the leaf and flower structure is a bit different. And of course, this was a highland plant growing up at about, about 1,600, 700 meters from memory. So um, don't really know what that represents now. It perhaps might be something a little bit different, but it certainly is very similar to Nepenthes philippinensis. Um, and as, as I mentioned earlier, all these hunters that very occasionally come to the lower slopes, they will hunt this Almasiga resin, which is this incredible compound. It, it's from the Almasiga trees. And basically, as soon as you touch it with a match, it, blur, it bursts into flames. So even if it's pouring and, and raining down, you can actually start a fire really quickly. Anyway, this is that other Philippinensis plant. It has a very distinctive narrow top, a bit, bit of a bulbous base at the bottom, and much, much bigger than Nepenthes philippinensis. So, um, so that's an interesting one to look at. Anyway, so we proceeded to continue up, macheting our way through, um, really after about 1,600, 700 meters, there were no, no traces whatsoever of any visitors at all. We started just to machete our way up, and at the very top, when we finally reached the summit, we found this magnificent plant, um, which um, my guide got very attached to. <laughs> I'm giving it a smooch there. And, well, I was having a peer inside. And as you can see, what was really striking was just the size. It was even bigger than Nepenthes atemburii. And what was immediately apparent is that whereas Nepenthes atemburii very rapidly produces upper pitches, you, you see lower pitches only on tiny plants. In this one, we saw absolutely no upper pitches at all, just like Nepenthes peltata. And um, yeah, even the, the large flowering plants produces, produce lowers. Um, so it was very quickly apparent that um, 
the structure of the pictures, the coloration, the size, the, the structure of the leaf, the, the flower, all the characteristics, and also the fact that it doesn't produce upper pictures clearly distinguish it from the Penthes um, Attenborough. So very fortunate that, that those, those ideas that it might be distinct from those other mountains seem to hold true. And um, I'm not sure whether this is going to work. I did a little, little, little uh, video. I don't know whether this is going to work or not. Oh, possibly not. Oh, I'll have to share it another time. If you come up to me in the, in the, in the orangery, I'll show you. Anyway, it's basically, this video shows you that it's so big, I put my entire hand inside it, and it's almost as big that I could almost put two. It's, it's a really, really big trap, about 25 centimetres, well, at least 20 centimetres wide or so at the top, and maybe 35 or so in, in, in size, um, as you can see there. And, and say the leaf structure clearly distinguished it as, as well. So after we reached the summit, we actually had to descend because there was absolutely no water on the upper slopes. And we, we made it back down to this lake, which was supposedly haunted by a, by a giant serpent, which apparently uh, one of the guide's friends had once seen, but uh, had to run away from, but didn't take a photograph. Um, so <laughs> we were a little bit sus suspect, but we weren't allowed to camp anywhere near this lake. We were up here somewhere. Um, Anyway, so the last plant that I'm going to quickly show you today is Nepenthes gantungensis, which is the third new, new Nepenthes from the Philippines to be found. Um, I was very lucky again to go back to Palawan. Um, this, uh, actually, was on the same trip as that Nepenthes palawanensis expedition. And um, we, it was actually a very funny mountain. Get, Mount Gantung is down in the south of Palawan, and it's, it's technically in a protected area in the Mount Mantalingahan protected range. But there's massive um, commercial mines all over the mountain. And basically, um, we, we went down there and were trying to find guides. And very strangely, this big, massive, black like Land Rover Jeep pulled up against me. And the window came down, and the camera started coming out. And click, 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 taking photos. And um, Jason, myself, and, and Chen Li was also there, actually. We, we were sort of <laughs> not really sure what to quite make of that. And the car sort of circled around us, came around again, and came up and, and circled past, taking photos. So that was pretty strange, and then just dis disappeared down a dusty track. So we, we weren't too short to make of that, but hired some guides anyway and proceeded up the mountain. And we, we camped basically in an old hunting lodge up at the top. And one of our guides ran back down to the village to basically find out what had happened. And he heard that basically the mining company was sending some people after us. So the very next morning, we set out well before dusk and started just to continue to try and lose them because it seemed very strange. I guess they didn't want us taking photographs of their mines because it was technically a protected area or something. So, um, so we actually made quite a swift, swift exit that next morning and fortunately never saw, saw a head or, or tail of them. Uh, on, along the way, we saw a spectacular blood-red form of Nepenthes philippinensis, which again shows how variable some of these Philippine plants are. We, we, I'd never seen a plant like a form of a philippinensis like that before, um, with beautiful blood-red pictures um, and, and spectacular coloration. And as you can see along the way, there's just the most incredible plants, these gigantic tree ferns, um, and, well, the group relaxing a little bit. And um, yeah, basically, some of the incredible animals. This is a, a land planarium, which is like a like a carnivorous. I believe it's like a carnivorous worm, which um, hunts different animals and orchids, of course. And as we proceeded up to the summits, after about three days, we, we broke out of um, lower montane uh, cloud forest right up into um, to the scrub on the summit. And um, when we actually got up to these, this big ridge side, um, as we slowly approached the, the top, we um, we could actually. Sorry, we, when we actually got to the top, we found, to our great surprise, a house. <laughs> there was a, a concrete repeater tower right at the top, which apparently uh, communicates messages across the islands. So that was a bit of a surprise on such a remote mountain, but that was taken from a plane later on. But um, anyway, as we got up to the upper slopes of this mountain, we found this magnificent Nepenthes, and it's extremely closely related to Nepenthes mirror. But um, different aspects of basically the picture, the leaf morphology, and the flower separates it from that plant. And it's very interesting because it occurs right on the other end of, of Palawan that Nepenthes mirror occurs. So um, the fact is that obviously there must be a common ancestor that must have diverged along the island, giving rise to Nepenthes diniana, Nepenthes, um, Nepenthes mira, Nepenthes um, mantilingahanensis, and also presumably Nepenthes um, gantungensis down here in the south. Um, and as you can see, it's a very beautiful plant, often with an orange or, or red peristome, with very prominent peristome spikes, uh, and upper pitches that are very similar to um, many of the other species from Palawan. But as I say, very distinct morphology that separates it from um, most others. 
and that's the peristome there. Um, and uh, then pretty much we, we started descending and, and returned back down. So basically, at the, at the, at the 21st century, at the start of this, d this century, there's 24 species. And it can honestly be said that, especially down in Palawan and Mindanao, we really have only begun to look at the mountains that occur there, especially in, in the south of Mindanao, which still today is a very violent conflict area. There was a huge massacre there just a couple of months ago. Very few botanists really go here. Very few um, naturalists go and explore the mountains. And still, we ha there are literally hundreds and hundreds of mountains across the Philippine archipelago, but especially in the south, that could hold, hold Nepenthes species. And as mentioned throughout this talk, the, the, the trend is that the overwhelming majority of Nepenthes of the Philippines are endemic to just one or two mountains and occur nowhere else in the world. So when you really, really think about that, the scope of new species in, in, the, in the Philippines really is, is pretty much unparalleled. Um, it's very interesting because, as I say, in the last 10 years alone, the number of species in the Philippines that are recognized has more than doubled. And as I say, there are literally hundreds more mountains to occur. So. At the moment, we think of really Borneo as, as the epicenter of Nepenthes diversity, at least in terms of yeah, morphological diversity. Um, but really, I mean, you know, the Philippine species doubled in 10 years. Who knows what we're going to find in the future? So um, thank you very much for listening. I hope that was a bit of an introduction to these spectacular Nepenthes. <laughs> um, <laughs> By the way, if, if anyone is interested, those three species were actually described in these, these two new books that, that you very kindly mentioned a minute ago. They arrived from the printers from India yesterday. So if you'd, very, if you'd like to see the very first copies, literally, well, literally that have been printed, they're, um, they're in the little orangery room in there. So I'd um, be happy to, to show you them. So thank you very much indeed for listening to me. And if there's any questions at all, it'd be a, be a pleasure to, to answer any. Oh, please. Yeah. Unless I misheard you, earlier you said you found Kirklandii um, on Mount Halpern. Oh, sorry, I must have made a mistake. It was Mount Apple we went to. Apologies, sorry. <laughs> must have been a slip of the tongue. Sorry. Cool. Any other questions, please? Yes, is there any Nepenthes there that is not spectacular or magnificent? <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw a genius here. Uh, oh, <laughs> this would be spectacular. Cool. Any other, any other questions at all? Oh, please. I have a question about the ventricles. Like you've seen also populations on Panay. What's your view about the ventricles? I do want to. I'm just trying to think. Uh, let me just go back. We actually. Because it's strange, it's uh, this guy from Luzon, right? That on the middle you have work here. Yeah. On Panay is something. We actually, we did. We saw Falker had specimens at this plant. We originally thought it was Burkia. We actually went there. No, it was Ventricosa. Yeah, we did. We, we definitely went down there. I mean, this was three years ago. But I've got photos. I basically brought all my images that I've ever taken on these trips. If anyone wants to see anything in more detail, I've got like, them in, in my, my car so I can show you them all. Um, or if you want copies or whatever, that's fine. Um, yeah, I'm 90% I'm, I'm certain that that was where we went. And, and I can show you the pictures of what we saw there. So yeah, I th I'm pretty sure that's, that, that's what we saw. Yeah, cool. Any other questions? Um, have you been to Zamboanga? No, never been there. Because I, I would say many years ago, I was scuba diving trip, and the hot springs there, and suddenly brought me a picture, which unfortunately I didn't keep, and it's not anything I've ever seen before, so I think that's worth a look, but it's, it's pretty dangerous. Yeah, I heard so, yeah. Um, I know it was for sure as well, there's at least two other new ones on, on Falker's Pitcher, Pitcher Plant Farm Forum. A fellow, I, I'm not sure it's from that, that part or not, but there's at least two or three other incredibly, they, they basically look a bit like Sibonensis ventricosa type plants, but yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, sure you're right. I think so, that's my understanding, unfortunately, at the moment, but um, let's hope it calms down a little bit. I mean, it, just to show how much it can change, even 10 years ago, people were warning against going to Palawan, because um, it had like, a, especially down the south, like an Islamic insurgency there. So fingers crossed, if it calms down a bit, we can, we can, we can go back. Um, but again, it just, it just it proves the point. I mean, there could be so much here, we, we just simply don't know. Um, so yeah, it would it, be very interesting to go back. Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, when I was, I was there last year, I went to um, Davao, and I think it was Davao, a bomb literally just 200 metres, like a, a couple of blocks over, 200 metres away or so, literally blew a bus apart. 
um, which was quite scary because I was actually on the bus at the time. <laughs> um, and it, it literally just blew the thing apart. I mean, so yeah, it, it really is an ongoing issue. And unfortunately, it looks like it's one that very sadly isn't, especially down here, isn't really being resolved at the moment, very sadly, because there are a number of problems that are continuing to say there was a, a terrible massacre just quite recently. Um, so it, it's, it's very sad because the, the Filipinos are the most lovely, kind, warm, friendly people that I've ever met. And it's very sad that their, um, their beautiful homeland is, is unfortunately having these conflicts. But yeah, fingers crossed, if it, if it calms down, it would be incredible to go and explore some more places because who knows what's out there? There really could be anything. And as I said in the talk, these, these islands out of Nepenthes, they're the lands of the giant species. Um, on, Nepenthe, on Palawan, you've got Gantung, Gantungensis, um, Victoria, so Attenborough, Palawanensis, Diniana, Mira, all of those species produce really big pitches um, that are, you know, could be 25 centimetres or more big. Um, down here in Mindanao, obviously, you've got um, Meriliana, Peltata, two really big species, again, that can produce huge traps. So um, the scope for down here is, is incredible, what could be down there, if all of the other species are all locally endemic to one or two mountains, and the majority of them, or pretty much all of them, are huge. Um, the scope for more spectacular Nepenthe species down here is, is incredible. But unfortunately, it's also the area that's the most dangerous. So um, unfortunately, I, I guess probably we won't know. It'll remain a mystery for many more years. So thank you very much. Oh, please. Yeah. Well, I, I don't really know much about these at all. Yeah. Um, I, I know a lot of them are coral atolls, which, which probably won't. But I, I, to be honest, I know very little about this. There's a, a large, unfortunately, there, there were a number of kidnappings about 10 years ago in this part of Sabah. And this area really, it, it's been um, uh, tourists, uh, foreigners at least can't go between the Philippines and Sabah, at least as far as I'm aware, a year ago. Um, that you just simply can't, you physically can't do it. So it's very difficult to go here. Um, and, and yeah, because of these pirates and these fishermen that use petro uh, with explosive bombs and stuff, it's all, it's all a very dangerous area. Um, so the truth is that I, I honestly don't know. Um, there were reports of Nepenthes ampullaria stretching up into the, the southern tip of, of Mindanao. I don't know really whether that's true or not, but I think you're absolutely right. There's definitely scope that it could occur, could occur there. If it occurs in Singapore off, off Peninsula Malaysia, then there's, there's no reason why it couldn't have spread to you know, similar, similar islands that aren't too, too far away as well. So who knows? <laughs> but again, I guess it'll be a few years. Yeah. I could add, because I was looking at mining maps for ultramafic sites in, uh, in this area of Malaysia because of the description of New Jersey. And these little islands, this is an ultramafic, uh, a line of ultramafic soil which is connecting parts of Mindanao with the... Um, really? Wow. Yeah, with this part of, of Borneo. And there had been a land bridge from Mindanao to, to Borneo. Yeah. Um, in contrast to Palawan, which was even in glacial times, never connected to Borneo because there's a deep sea ridge. Okay, I stand corrected. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, if these are ultramafic, it gives incredible scope for them to have something up there. I mean, it's very conceivable. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I mean, re regardless of, I mean, also you've obviously got the trade winds, so even if there wasn't a land bridge, like, the, the, the point is that the trade winds, also the seeds, it's, it's very conceivable with hurricanes coming across and stuff. So who knows? I mean, it, it's a very interesting part of the world. And um, I, yeah, I think it's going to be many years before we understand the full diversity of, of plants and animals that actually occur here, because um, yeah, it, it really has remained so difficult to get into, and so few people have really, really gone and, and really done systematic studies. So, um, yeah, I think it's a fascinating part to, to continue to explore. So thank you very much indeed for listening. And if I can help with any other questions or information at all, um, please, it would be a pleasure. So, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very good. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you.